or even closer. But you know, it's an issue. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dina Stewart. I'm extremely pleased to be able to welcome Kevin Lyons to Valdebro. He's um, been here before. He spoke at a conference that I produced uh, last. November, both in New Hampshire and in Vermont, and he came to Brattleboro and hopped on a car and drove over new, to New Hampshire and spoke as the keynote and did a full day presentation on some of the things that you're going to hear today. And then he went over to Montpelier and also did a session there. Um, both conferences were very successful. People were able to have one-on-one -on -one experiences with Kevin talking about what he's doing in records and how that applies to places like Hitchcock Hospital. Um, I'm really thrilled that Kevin was able to make another trip up here so soon. It's within six months. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy hearing what he has to say tonight. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to try my best to keep this light. I'm not sure how you guys do this every day. I actually um, I sat in on a few of the, uh, the sessions today. And I'm telling you, you guys are uh, you're being instructed by uh, very, very well uh, informed, very in, uh, great group, uh, group of faculty here. I really appreciate the, uh, uh, them letting me in in your little world. But now it's five, and it's time for a nap. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks to Kimbria uh, for uh, the kind words. And uh, Katie, Katie and Kimbria, my new, uh, two new friends up in uh, the North Country here. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to try to uh, my best to keep this light. Uh, save uh, your questions for the deep probing kind of stuff afterwards. I didn't want to bring a bunch of formulas, a supply chain management type. We like to do a lot of uh, uh, formulas and uh, demand side stuff. And that's just, uh, it's interesting. It actually holds together the types of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But what I'm going to present to you tonight is more of a, uh, an overview, it's more of a case study of a university that I believe, you know, with its size and scope, actually came together and it did something I believe is quite uh, remarkable. Um, I'm only going to give you the, the good stuff. I might actually add a couple of negative things along the way just to, uh, to spice it up a bit. But the program I'm going to present to you is uh, 22 years in the making, all wrapped up in 39 slides. And I have to tell that to my students because they keep pace. It's like 39 slides, right? And then they're actually in the back, you know, counting. It's like, um, so this way they have a, a good feeling of, of when it's all going to wrap up. But I hope that I, I, I can engage you for a little bit. Um, what I'd like to start by uh, doing, rather than jumping into my PowerPoint presentation, I had promised my art students, because um, those are the recent converts that we've recently got at the university to participate in the university-wide sustainability efforts, uh, to show their little uh, one, two-minute podcast. Because if I didn't, I get back, they're going to hear about it, and now this is being taped. You know, hot water. So I'd like to show just a couple. And if we have time at the end, I'll show you a couple more brilliant that students who would otherwise not be engaged in this discussion uh, somehow or another were able to pull it all together and do something on behalf of the university that uh, speaks volumes to not only is this something for uh, the environmental science folks, and it's great that the business folks are also engaged, in, which is what my presentation is going to be about, but now to actually have our, our liberal arts and our uh, uh, non-scientific students actually engaged as well in doing good things on the behalf of the university. So let me just go ahead and sort of give you a little taste of what they pretty much told me to do. A lot of what you're going to see is actually going to be in the presentation itself in, in great uh, detail. But um, I'm going to show two. The first one is actually dealing with the uh, university's uh, food waste. Okay, so. Earlier today, I had discussions about what is the university doing to try to reduce uh, its food waste on the front end and actually get students to be sensitive to uh, what they're putting on their plates and what ultimately gets disposed of. So we launched a campaign about that uh, over a year or so ago. And as a result of not only that initiative, but the students actually stepping up and creating this uh, little short film, 
it actually turned out to be something quite uh, remarkable. So hopefully you can, you can hear this. first one. Uh, let's see. You want to do bikes or bottled water? Bottled water. Let's do that. So, I showed the videos. All right, good. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the next uh, 30 minutes is I'm going to actually give you, again, the overview of green purchasing at, at Rutgers University. So, um, I'm going to give a little history. I'm going to actually filter in with some examples and then show you some of our uh, contracts actually at work so you can see uh, some of the decision making that went into what we do and why we do it and then ultimately where we are right now. So at the very beginning, we had to actually come up with a premise for the whole concept of, of green purchasing. Now, what's unique about the university, when you look for the sustainability coordinator, the person who's ultimately responsible for uh, implementing environmental programs on the operational side of the university, with some research, if you stop any student, I hope, at the university and you ask him that question, the very interesting thing about the response you're going to get is that they're going to point to the purchasing department, which is very, very interesting. Instead of saying, well, I think it might be over at environmental sciences or it might be one of the environmental clubs on campus, the nice thing is that we've been able to prove not only through the work that we've done, but actually show that how purchasing, for those who are scholars in uh, business and procurement, that consumption, consumerism, waste disposal, and all of the environmental impacts that we are actually studying today, in some cases 
our department has come into contact with. So what we started to do is we started to take a look at how the supply chain actually impacts uh, us going green. So basically what we wanted to do is say, okay, if we're going to do this, uh, and again, this started back in the, uh, the late 80s, um, we have to show that this is a project and a program that's showing that procurement is the best practice. This is how all procurement and supply chain managers should actually operate. We have to both not only go after those products and work with our manufacturers and distributors, but show a high demand for it. As a university of our size and scope, which I'm going to show you in a second, um, in all universities and colleges, very high as far as the demand side. The things that we do at our universities and the fact that our students, in most cases, are demanding it, sets us up to be the prime uh, place for actually priming this market. The organizational footprint, environmental footprint, the soft stuff that we actually talk about at university then becomes real. The university is actually running numbers quite frequently to show how the university is actually reducing its environmental impact, uh, not only on campus, but the communities that actually surround the university. And I'll get into that a little bit uh, as we get into the uh, presentation. Then came our contracts. How can we actually use the power of the contract to actually demonstrate what it is that we believe in as an institution? Uh, again, using the contract as the front gatekeeper of sorts to say that if you want to do business with the university, then these are some of the things that you're going to have to uh, comply with. So just, uh, basically developing our standard statement of work or specifications or contracts, everything that we're about and using that as a, a communication tool. And then the last thing is actually, can we actually do this uh, through the marketplace? Rather than being heavy on policy and trying to demand uh, things through regulation, can we actually push the market and make it happen naturally and then uh, keep it going in that respect? So here's a very crude, very, very simplified uh, supply chain that we were studying in the very, very beginning. Um, so if you look at this, uh, raw materials, logistics, transportation, to the manufacturer, there's some packaging involved, there's a manufacturing process, there's more logistics and transportation getting it to the distributor, then the distributor gets it, it's now time for it to be, again, transferred to the uh, customer, in our case, it's the university. We use the actual product, and then we have to get into the logistics and transportation. Now we've got to take it as waste and actually get it someplace uh, off campus, uh, and that means landfilling, recycling, reuse, and possibly remanufacturing. So what the university was actually looking at at the very beginning, which is very unique for us to be this forward thinking, is this last piece right here. Um, what can we do with those particular goods and services once they reach the university? And can we actually have an impact upstream by concentrating on what we're actually doing downstream and actually figure out a way to work with our manufacturers and our distributors to design products that have a reduced impact on the backside. So the university is not paying for not only the products and services that we use, but also paying for the logistics and the waste that actually ends up. And can we actually take the byproduct of waste and work with our faculty on the research side and develop other mechanisms for actually getting new products that are being developed with the waste on the back end to try to redesign some effect this supply chain that actually could benefit not only the university but uh, industry in general. So in a sense, this whole system thinking process, if you try to get a snapshot of what this looks like, is going to take us through the rest of the, uh, the presentation. Okay? And it will justify some of the things and some of the decisions that the university has made based on looking at the supply chain in this way. Okay, so um, I've actually split this up into three sections. Uh, talking about policy overview, second part, uh, well, first part, just an overview, second part, policy, talking with our suppliers, and then the third part is just actually showing what we are, are doing in practice. So a little bit of background. Now, one thing that I haven't talked about very much is then you say to yourself, okay, how did a supply chain management type person, professional, get involved in the environment, okay? So my PhD is in supply chain management, undergraduates in math. It's like the environment, you know, where does it somehow fit? So I have a quick story that I'll tell you. Um, my history, and everyone's got one, if you 
nail somebody down who's really passionate about the environment and ask them how you got uh, involved. They're going to sort of give you your take. My take actually started, you know, in high school, in the clubs and such, and all excited about that. But really, really took off was when I went into the military. Went to the military right after after high school. Knew my parents couldn't afford college, so I didn't even ask. You know, we had six siblings, and I was in the middle someplace. And at that point, it was like uh, the writing was on the wall. So um, went into the military with the idea of, of going to school at night. So went trained. Everything's great. First job procurement. That's how my career got started. In procurement. My very first assignment assigned to Wyoming, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Didn't even know it existed, but it was actually on the map, and there I was. And my first order that I had to do was buy chemicals to wipe out the gophers on the polo field. So the officers could play polo without their horses tripping and such. So here I am, you know, fresh in the first day that I got into the military, and the first thing I had to do being Mr. Eco. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And um, so we had a lot of discussions with my commanding officer at the time. Now, this lasted for about two weeks, me saying no and then thinking of ways that, you know, we're going to kick you out. You know, you're now government property. We're telling you what to do. You're getting out. And so at the time, there was this magazine. It was uh, Omni Magazine. I don't know if you guys remember that. And there was an article in there about replacing uh, uh, problem pets, rodents, and such. And the way the article went was that if you smoke them out and they stick their little heads out, then you can take a blow dart and shoot them and put them to sleep. And then you can take them to another part and rehabilitate them. So I'm not going to get into the details of how I was able to convince the military to do this, but we did it. They actually said, OK, the first polo match is in a month. So you basically have a month to get this done. So in the late 80s, there was no war going on. Um, and so I convinced the etymology department the infantry department, my department, and several other folks to actually not only buy the blow darts, buy the smoking machines, <laughs> and um, use this as target practice. That was my, um, my pitch. So we had about 120 of us all out on the polo field, walking up and down, smoking these things out and shooting them and picking them up and taking them to the other side of the base. And um, I did the cost analysis. It was a lot cheaper. We actually didn't uh, spend as much as if we were to actually bought the chemicals because we would have to eradicate the chemicals as well before we resurfaced and replanted in the whole nine yards. So I was actually one step from actually getting kicked out of the military. And at the end of this whole entire parade, I actually got a commendation medal. <laughs> So that was my start into the environment, purchasing. Purchasing can actually think sometimes out of the box and get things done. So um, supply chain, purchasing, and the environment, how we connect that. I'm going to talk about that as we go through the presentation. Now, what officially got Rutgers involved was state policy. In 1988, we actually had a policy at the university, actually in the state, that mandated recycling. Okay? So after the first year of the plan, we were supposed to be recycling 25% of our waste. Now, this policy actually came out six weeks before school started. All right? So we went from everything going in the trash to actually having to set up a full-fledged recycling program um, at the university and have it start when the kids and the faculty and everyone arrived back at school. That's when we first started to think about that supply chain that you saw. What ultimately are we going to have to recycle, and where is it actually coming from? a complete analysis of all the products and services, uh, mainly products, but services that produced uh, waste was put into that supply chain. And then we started to negotiate with our suppliers about what is in it, how is it packaged, and we did a lot of analyses on our waste stream just to see how we can actually set up and strategically put recycling containers where they were actually generating the most uh, waste. We were able to meet the first year's uh, goals and we did recycle 25% of our waste stream. In 1995, that actually jumped to 60%. So really, the university's plan not only was to look at waste management and recycling and using that as a tool, but purchasing was the one working with our facilities, our housing, dining, our uh, academics, to 
to actually take a look at what they were purchasing and ultimately could we actually capture that and in some cases predict to our facilities department what their actual budget was going to be based on what we were buying and how much they should set aside for waste management and recycling. We actually got it down to within a couple thousand dollars out of an enterprise that actually spends about four to five million dollars a year on waste management and recycling. So again, purchasing, actually looking at the full system thinking approach to how we deal with our waste. And Rutgers as the Ecolab, we basically turned the entire university into the place where we needed to study not only waste management, but this whole concept at the time was called environmental uh, protection. So using all of our faculty and all their disciplines to actually help us uh, make this uh, a reality. So the early research and the experiments that we were doing, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, federal government at that point, once they looked at Rutgers University, the uh, federal government actually contacted us and we actually helped craft some of the uh, federal uh, regulations as it relates to waste prevention and recycling uh, and the green purchasing as well. So we were really at the very beginning of that as well. And then at some point, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about some of our international uh, research. So the university, uh, 51,000 students, 11,000 faculty and staff, uh, 906 buildings, uh, purchasing power, $400 million a year. Um, and that compares to uh, all of higher education, the all 400, uh, 400, 600 universities and colleges in the United States uh, collectively purchase about $300 billion worth of goods and uh, supplies. Um, the reason why I put that up there, again, going back to the purchasing power that higher education has to push and move the market, uh, university, uh, uh, Rutgers University has, in some cases, and again, I'll demonstrate that by itself, but we're now on a big push to start looking at all of our universities and colleges throughout the United States and getting them all collectively on the same bandwagon so we can actually drive some more uh, innovation and change. $60 million on energy. The interesting thing about that statistic and the reason why I put it up there, that number has actually stayed pretty much the same within the last five or six years. As the university has continued to grow, as the price of fuel has actually skyrocketed, the university with all of its practices, which I'm going to show you, has actually maintained and actually in some cases have even reduced its energy output, mainly on energy conservation initiatives by our students, by our faculty, by our staff, but also strategic investments in alternative fuel and alternative uh, energy sources, which again I'll talk about in a second. Okay, So 60% recycling rate, we've made it. Here are some of the items that the university recycles. So it's not just limited to bottles, cans, and paper. What we do is we design our contracts to actually capture the waste on the back end. So when you get a, a Rutgers University contract for computers, it's going to tell you that the university is going to purchase X millions of dollars worth of your computers. And we want a take back plan. We want an environmental management plan that's actually going to have uh, some bite to it so that the university, when ordering a computer, has a place for either the one that's sitting on their desk or the ones that happen to be piling up in the, uh, in the closet that they're going to actually find a home to get completely uh, recycled and shredded down if they're not usable. All right, so this whole closed loop contract concept is what allows us to capture and report on an annual basis all these uh, items that you see on the right to recycle, which actually gets us up to our 60% recycling rate. There's very little, if anything, that leaves the university that's not destined uh, for its proper destination. So the university mission is what we use to drive the program. Okay? If I went to the administration and told them about this program and said that we were going to develop something that was completely outside of what the university stood for, I can almost guarantee you that instead of 22 years, we'd have been stopped probably in year two. All right? So if you look at the university's mission, and this is just excerpts from it, it talks about cutting-edge research, which we demonstrate, environmental, social, and cultural well-being of the state. Okay? The state university, a public university, has this in their mission, and we believe the sustainability programs and the supply chain management uh, initiatives that we've taken fit nicely into that. And then the second bullet, performing a public service on behalf of the uh, state. Okay? And we're going to show you how we're doing that by sharing 
our contracts with the local communities as well in getting them ramped up. So a definition for green purchasing. Minimizes negative environmental impacts through the use of environmentally friendly products. Really simple. We went to the federal government and the state and said, listen, we want to do this, but you've got to keep it simple. If folks don't understand what you're talking about, they're not going to do it. Second, adding environmental considerations. That basically is saying that every purchasing decision that we're making with our manufacturers, we have to add some environmental considerations and blend that with the price and the performance of the products themselves. Okay? The university is not uh, loaded up with budgets where we actually have all this money to spend 10% more for the goods and services just because they're green. We have to actually put this into a competitive process in order for us to not only get environmentally responsible products, but get them at a competitive price and actually drive the market by actually making that part of the uh, competitive process. Okay? And then lastly, attempts to identify and reduce environmental impacts um, and risk as well. The university actually has reduced its uh, liability and workman's compensation uh, price, I mean our coverage for the university, by the entire university adopting this sustainability initiative. So there's a financial benefit. The university actually spends close to $40 million a year on its liability and workman's compensation insurance. The university has been able to reduce that by 10%. Uh, each year as we start to reintroduce new products, green cleaning supplies. We're not purposely trying to kill our custodial staff anymore. <laughs> Looking at energy saving light bulbs that actually last longer, and we made the case about being up and down on the ladder, and that would be a, uh, a dangerous uh, activity for our uh, workers as well. So taking apart this entire supply chain, looking for opportunities not only in the products themselves, but what are the tentacles that those are connected to? And in that case, looking at insurance and how we're trying to protect not only the students, the faculty and the staff, but the communities that surround us and the workers who are actually making the products that the university is going after. We actually put together a very nice uh, package and shared that with uh, Liberty Mutual, MetLife, and Prudential. And within a couple of weeks, they actually reduced the university's insurance liability and workman's comp. So green purchasing is not, again, only about the products themselves and looking at the supply chain. It's everything else that it's actually physically connected to. So the president's house. So you've got to start from top to bottom. So I'm going to attack this university no matter who actually gets in our way. And at the time, the president was sort of um, a challenge. Um, so with all good purchasing folks, you've got to negotiate. And our negotiation started with the president's wife. Um, a Rutgers grad, a Rutgers Cook College grad, can't go wrong. So we set up a little meeting with her and pretty much told her, all right, this is our plan. This is your house, and this is our plan. <laughs> and she uh, kind of looked at us and said, I don't think Dick's going to go for this. Um, so we said, all right, we'll set up a second meeting, and you can bring the president in, and we'll give him the plan. Um, so we did. We actually sat down, and prior to that meeting with the president, he knew that we were coming in. He knew something about the plan, but he, you know, he was a little bit scared. So we show up at the house. He's a little bit late. He's not there. We said, oh, he, he punked out on this. We're going to be here all by ourselves uh, speaking to his wife. Five minutes later, he comes busting through the door with his canvas bags and his um, alternative uh, laundry detergent and all the other stuff that he could probably find you know, up on the shelves. Um, and sat everything down on the table and said, what, you know, what about this? Did I do a good job? And from that particular point forward, this was a couple of years ago, it's been a cakewalk. This guy actually gets it, and we've literally taken over his house. <laughs> um, now, there's one thing I do have to mention. The house is actually a historic landmark, and half the house is owned by the university, public, and then we give them a little private. Uh, on the second floor, but we took over that as well. Um, so basically, interior cleaning chemicals, we put an environmental management system in that turns off the lights and heats and air conditioning when we believe it should be. Um, appliances, recycling, lighting, Energy Star, we're actually uh, working towards getting the facility Energy Star rated. Um, work with our facilities guys to actually, again, take over the property 
re did uh, some planting, reusing some of the rainwater to use on the property itself, and actually changed their entire diet plan. They do nothing but shop at our local farmers and participate in our cooperative uh, and local farms as well. So he's actually got a little garden in the back now that he actually created uh, about a year and a half ago. So it's really exciting. So what we're doing here and demonstrating is that you got to start and get the leadership involved, engaged, get them actually physically involved. Now the only thing that he hasn't done is start taking the uh, campus bus. The campus bus actually stops right close to his property. So his wife was really getting into this and saying, well, yeah, he can take the bus too. And I said, well, yeah, you can pull that one off. Um, but we said, yeah, that'd probably be the only express bus on campus. So they'll probably leave, you know, and all the kids are looking by and watching their stops go by. Um, but anyway, this has been really exciting for us and actually something that we uh, want to continue. Okay, so policy. The university does have a green purchasing policy. Um, it starts off with the whole concept of consumption. We hit that one heavy. We actually look at consumption and whether or not we actually need the actual product in the first place um, with a concentration on zero waste. Asking and challenging our students and faculty to actually look at what it is that you're um, procuring. So it's not going to be ultimately purchasing the job. We're actually pushing this out into the field and asking our faculty, staff, and students to become part of the front line of requesting it in a more intelligent way. And that is what we have, what we call zero waste. Cradle to cradle concept more than price. We're looking at what is that product going to cost us as far as its use, its production, and ultimately when we throw it away. So our contracts are now asking for not only the price of the product, we're actually asking for and getting life cycle assessment costing in all of our contracts. So if you're going to get a copier, it's not going to say $2,000. It's going to actually say the price of the copier is $2,000. If you use it over the life of it, which is probably about four or five years, you're going to spend X amount of dollars on supplies. These are the types of supplies you're going to have to buy. Ultimately, it's going to become a waste item, and then you're going to have to look at that as well. So we're looking at cradle to cradle in our supply chain management contract design, and actually looking at that. Um, as a standard for how we do contracts. There's policy in there about green buildings, landscaping, construction, renovation, bio-based and biodegradable products, energy and water conservation, uh, labels and certification, and one of my very, very uh, important but almost a uh, pet peeve of mine is corporate social and environmental reporting. Making sure that whoever we engage with as a contract supplier understands that it's not just the products that we want from you. We want you to be in relationship with the university. The contract is what binds us, but we're very concerned about who you are and what you're doing, not only here in the state of New Jersey, but wherever you and your affiliates are actually uh, operating. So we want, on a quarterly basis, updates and reports about what you're doing as a corporation, and that is a condition of the contract. So some of the examples of what we get back, um, these are just some of the highlights off of their uh, reports, but we're getting stuff from our furniture contractor, which happens to be Hayworth. Cisco is a food distributor, but looking at their sustainable agriculture is one of the things that we actually zoomed in on and said that's something that interests the university. Uh, Barnes & Noble, which is still a uh, family-owned business, which most folks uh, don't know. Uh, so we went and spoke with the family and basically said, if you're going to bring something like that on campus, then here's the conditions that we want this store to have and some of the things that we want you to promote and some of the business practices that we want you to change, um, which they have done. Uh, Fisher Scientific is a scientific uh, lab supplies. Pepsi, they came to us with this very, very weak package. You know, our bottles are made lighter and the plastic is not, and I'm like, no, that's not what we're looking for. Um, so they have now, and the students and I actually helped them, develop a rainwater washing system for all their trucks. Now we're actually talking about something that uh, is high impact for the university because we're concerned about water conservation and what your part in this is going to be. And looking at your affluent from your factories and making sure that none of that is getting into the rivers and streams like the issues that we had with uh, Coke. 
Now, that's a whole other presentation I'll have to give you, but again, corporate social responsibility around the world in the issues that were happening with Coke down in Bogota, Colombia, and India was something that actually moved the university to cancel and terminate uh, that contract based on the fact that we don't want a partnership with an entity that is not, again, practicing what we believe to be uh, good practice. So Verizon and Agilent and some of the others. Um, so research. So it's not all about um, just trial and error. The university has actually given us a lot of leverage. So I'm able to not only do the administrative side of my job, but I actually have a lab, probably the only supply chain manager in higher education and purchasing that actually has a lab. And what we actually do is we bring in products from all over the place and we do our own testing ourselves. So there's research and development that's going on at the company and there's research and development that's happening right on campus. And our purchasing folks who thought that they were being hired to sit down and just order stuff are actually in the lab. They like wearing their little lab coats and they like actually um, uh, being in the lab actually looking at product development design and performance. Of course looking at the cost is critical. Um, environmental health impacts and looking at labels and whether or not the labels themselves are actually what is happening with that particular product. Very, very important to us. You may or may not have heard the term greenwashing. That's basically an environmental claim that is basically there to make you buy the product and then when you look at it, it's like, well, that's not really what. But it's very, very clever, but something that we have to educate our supply chain managers and procurement professionals on to make sure that if we actually call a product green, and that it's priced and it's performing at what we want it to be, that it actually is doing the job. So that's the reason why you see all the rest of the bullets, total cost of ownership, global warming and climate change. I'm going to talk about that towards the end. Uh, we're looking at raw materials, where they came from, um, and their environmental impacts. Using our sophisticated e-procurement system and actually rewrote code to try to track some of this stuff within the system so we can actually run reports on our green purchasing efforts. Um, the contract language, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, end of life, looking at waste management and recycling. Our spend, life cycle assessment of costs, return on investment is embedded in every single decision and contract that university uses, whether it's green or not. But it's becoming part of the culture of actually awarding contracts at the university that we actually have to show uh, economics behind all these uh, green and sustainable decisions. And of course, I've already mentioned uh, corporate reporting. Just a quick bit on labels, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So here are some of the examples of what's out there. You've probably seen Energy Star, Green Seal, and some of the others. The thing that the university is very, very uh, keen on are labels that corporations actually have to buy, in a sense, in order to get that label on. So we're very, very uh, serious about looking at uh, eco label and certification schemes like Green Seal, which basically says you actually have to purchase uh, into their membership in order to do that. So we have a very, very close eye on some of these uh, labels to make sure that they're not on the label just because you're big enough and you're powerful enough to actually get that label on your product. So what we pretty much boiled it down to is that obviously we have to communicate in verifiable and accurate information. So that's what we're looking at labels and making sure that it's uh, correct. You know, encourage demand and supply of environmentally sound products and services. So basically the labels itself, if it's properly placed on there and actually is doing the job, will do that. Reduce the stress on the environment and then stimulate markets. Very, very basic, but we want to make sure that the labels that we actually have and the certifications that are out there are actually demonstrating that. Um, field research. Now this is something that, again, is unique to uh, supply chain professionals and purchasing folks. I spend two days now a week at our local landfill digging around in the muck. Um, but a supply chain manager's and purchasing's perspective on waste, you know, how many purchasing folks or supply chain managers do you know that actually get out and find out the, uh, what's happening with the results of some of the decisions that they've made, which in most cases they're ending up here in my other lab. 
Um, understanding the history, behavior, and movement of waste, consumption, consumerism, and linking and integrating supply chain management with solid waste management. Very, very important. Um, so there's a lot going on at the landfill. We're actually tagging some of the waste, looking at some of their uh, scientific properties as the waste is starting to degrade in the landfill, writing up reports and actually shooting that back up to some of our manufacturers to let them know some of the characteristics of the products that they've actually thought were well designed, well developed, and packaged. And guess what? Here they are. And this is what's happening with them on the back end, which has actually spawned a lot of great research and uh, collaboration with some of our manufacturers as well. One of the uh, projects that came out of me digging around in the, in, in the landfill was actually can you convert methane? into a viable commodity, in this case, liquid natural gas. So you already know what the answer is because I have the picture up. Um, so we spent three years actually looking at the end results of waste. Most landfills in the country actually burn off the methane gas. It's considered a greenhouse gas uh, contributor. And by burning it off, it actually reduces its impact. So our quick decision was, well, can we actually take that methane and convert it into something? So we ran the economic models, spent about a year doing that, convinced Mack Truck Volvo, Waste Management, Burlington County, and a small incubator called Acreon, which we kind of brought on campus and gave them the pitch. And basically said, could we actually do this and make it viable? Now, what made it viable is that we actually did take the methane that was coming off the Burlington County landfill and went through a series of cleaning and actually uh, cooling and got the liquid natural gas to the purity of 99.9% .9 pure. Again, working with Mack Truck, Volvo, who makes the majority of the garbage trucks, and forging that relationship through serious entrepreneurial discussions. And how can you actually make something go from an idea or concept to something that's viable? Another presentation. But it was very, very interesting to actually be able to pull this all together. Now, what made it viable is that the the station is actually at the landfill, the location where the waste is being dumped. If we were to actually take that landfill gas, make it into liquid natural gas, package it up and ship it someplace, then the value of it then goes down. All right, so our idea was that the waste trucks are going to be at the landfill anyway. That should be the source where the, and where the, source where the fuel should be dispensed. Okay? So the garbage trucks go, they dump their waste, they swing around, and they actually get refilled, and they go back out and collect. Uh, more waste. Perfect model. It's economically sound. And the second bullet on there, Edgeboro Landfill, which I put as new, is in negotiations right now up on the main campus, which is only about two miles off campus. And we're looking at our campus bus system as the demand side for the fuel that's going to be produced at that landfill. Okay? Something that's going to sustain that uh, facility for a number of years. Plus, we're looking at the counties transportation system. So all these folks are at the table now, sitting with us, planning the next stage of what is going to happen with that fuel. Okay? So again, supply chain actually identified a commodity that was being wasted and actually worked with our scientists to actually get it to the market. It actually proved itself, and now it's time to take it to another level. Food waste. Agricultural waste um, is a problem at the university, you saw the pig waste, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But the issue is how long can we actually feed our food waste to the pig farmer? We've had that contract now for 25 years, and I can't believe that we still are in business with that pig farmer. But we're buying produce, we're buying compost, we're buying all the things from that farmer, so we're giving them food waste, which by the way, we're paying for. And there's a story behind that. So, we decided that the pig farmer was charging us too much for our food waste. So we said that we were going to go out to bid. We are going to actually bid this out. And the pig farmer was, bid? You know, what is that? Um, so we sent out this bid. It went to waste management. It went to all the big companies and this pig farmer and a couple others. Um, so the price at the time was $5 a 55-gallon drum of food waste. And we thought we can get it a lot lower because we're smart. We have PhDs and we're smarter than a pig farmer. It should be an actual show. Um, so it came time for bid opening. 
and we look at the the uh, the ba uh, basket where the bids come in, and there's like one bid in there, and guess who it is? <laughs> the pig farmer. So I said, "Oh, brother, you know." So we open up the bid, <laughs> and he had doubled his price. <laughs> And he shows up at the bid opening to, you know, he's there, he says, this is a public bid. I heard, I read about it and I can sit in, right? I said, yeah, you can come in, sit down. And then open up the bids, $10, no, $12.50 from five bucks. And he goes, oh, no one else is here. Does that mean I get the bid? You know, I felt like jumping up and choking him. But yeah, <laughs> actually he did. And actually he still is our, our contracted supplier. But what is the next generation of that? So at the same facility where we're actually converting methane into liquid natural gas, we have this uh, facility set up, an anaerobic digester. And we're actually taking the greenhouse waste, uh, waste from Whole Foods Market and from the university and con uh, producing in a 24 to 48 hour compost uh, quick digression. And it's producing a methane that's being converted into gas again, which is powering up the, land, uh, the, uh, the greenhouse. So we're now in the stage of taking that, scaling it down, and bringing it back on campus, okay? So we have a couple of student MBA interns that are now turned into entrepreneurs. And in a sense, uh, that's their business. They're going to actually work with the university to bring that on campus and make it a reality. So it's very exciting. It's something that obviously we're going to be using for some time to come. And again, uh, something that was needed. This is our current practice for food waste. <coughs> it comes down. The kids dump off their food or their trays. It gets scraped off into this trough, which is basically water pushing the food waste down. It goes into this pulping system, which is what this is. It actually grinds the food up and extracts the water out of it. And uh, it's an eight to one ratio. So it grinds the food up and reduces its weight and volume by eight to one ratio. The water is actually reused and recirculated into the system, so it's not going down the drain. Um, so basically, it looks like this pulpy kind of stuff. And this is what the, uh, the pig farmer comes and collects on a daily basis, has not missed a day in 25 years um, at the university. And we enjoy his food. We enjoy his produce. And it's a nice closed uh, system. Um, other research, uh, plastics. Uh, the university has several patents on combining different types of plastic and making it into a viable construction material. So this is not that stuff that you see in Home Depot, where it's kind of a mix of wood and plastic. This is actually a process where you can actually take the ones, the fours, the sevens, and whatever it is, and actually bind it together to actually get it to stick. And so we're actually making construction material. And some of the applications you can see here, that's done at the Jersey Shore. So what you see there are plastic runs. This is the Chicago train line. We're replacing all the, uh, the creatine wood uh, ties with plastic lumber, also with uh, Conrail. We're actually now experimenting with bending it, and can you actually make it into a suspension? And then this bridge <coughs> was already constructed, so that's completed. But we're down in North Carolina now actually building a uh, one mile long bridge made totally of, of, of plastic, um, which is very interesting. OK, so I'm going to speak just real briefly on carbon impact and some of the research we're doing there. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at products, the next generation of labeling. Could you actually put a carbon reduction label or impact label on a product so a consumer can look at it and look at the label and see that not only has it got good ingredients in it, but what is that product's contribution to greenhouse gas and carbon impact? and be able to look at it with a symbol and be able to tell in grams how many uh, grams of uh, carbon are being impacted. So that was the premise. Now, this is a grant that the purchasing department actually got from the environmental sciences department. We actually took money from an internal research uh, facility, and they granted the purchasing department uh, $60,000 to actually prove that you can actually put carbon footprinting labeling systems on products. And so what we tried to do is look at a couple things. Product life cycle, life cycle costing analysis, total cost of ownership, return on investment, total life cycle valuing, looking at products in that respect, and then looking at greenhouse gas impacts of the waste. So you got a product, we looked at its life cycle, and added all the elements in there to try to come up and derive a number. Um, 
can't read this, but basically it's some of the uh, greenhouse gas statistics that we were able to yank out of this process. So within the product life cycle <coughs> itself, research and development, raw materials, manufacturing, packaging, sales distri uh, distribution and transportation, consumer use, final uh, disposition. What we're really trying to prove is can you actually look at uh, individual product and break it down to all of its supply chains and all of its manufacturers and look at the impacts that are happening along that chain. So we thought we would start with something really, really simple, a light bulb, uh, incandescent light bulb and a CFL light bulb and an LED light bulb. So we actually went in, did the research, visited a lot of factories, looked at all the products that are inside a light. This is an incandescent. And then looked at the greenhouse gas impacts, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases, and tried in the very first pass to find out if there are any elements of that that existed in the manufacturing process or the transportation or anything related to that. And we got stuck on glass. <laughs> We are actually still working on glass a year from now. We actually have a project that's probably going to take us 20 years to get finished. Um, but it's very, very interesting and fascinating to actually look at the supply chains, the supply chains of a supply chain, and actually try to figure out what is actually happening behind the scenes with all the products and services that the, uh, not only does the university use, but globally, and what's happening. So I'll have to report back to you a year from now and let you know what we're doing. So next steps is actually, as it says, drill into the life cycle of each ingredient. We looked at glass, but we found out that to be one of the most and most significant contributors of greenhouse gas. So we're actually spending a lot of time on that right now. And then looking at all the other ingredients within that. So we have a series of uh, uh, research interns that are actually helping us with this. Okay, so I want to end with some of the examples and how we kind of pulled all of this together. Here are some of our reports that we have to do to report back to our administration about uh, the greening process. So we report on our research. I mentioned some of the other elements, total cost of ownership, health impacts, the contract language, and a lot of return on investment um, statistics that we actually have to, uh, to demonstrate to the administration. And that also goes along the lines of what we spend on each one of these products as well, and then looking at waste management and recycling as a data point. This is an RFP, a typical request for proposal at the university. Start off with the university policy, university mission. We talk about green purchasing and climate impact, the manufacturing process, the raw materials used, waste management, extended product responsibility is embedded in each one of our contracts as well, environmental impacts, risk management, this is where we got our insurance information, so now that's a permanent fixture within we asked a serious question about risk management and what its con uh, contribution is. Social environmental reporting and then looking at economic and financials and using all of the tools that are necessary so we can evaluate that contract in its total. A uh, couple of examples, this is our PC laptop contract. Three PCs, three laptops, we contributed or concentrated onto that so we wouldn't actually put out a bid for everything that Apple, HP, Lenovo and Dell have to offer. We told them that these are the three models that we want you to bid on and we want you to have all these ingredients in it. EP, Energy Star, Energy Management, Corporate Social Responsibility, and a Life Responsibility. Same thing with our green cleaning chemicals, <coughs> where we switched over about two and a half years ago. This is the evaluation process, composition, health rating, bio-based content, dispensing system. Training was actually the highest ranking and highest evaluated item on the bid. It wasn't price. We wanted to say that if our custodial staff understood how to use the product and use it effectively, that will ultimately reduce our costs. And it absolutely has proven to be true. So all of our custodial staff are certified in the use of this product. Energy Star Partner, the university is a Energy Star Partner, <coughs> so we can actually certify our buildings internally uh, with our own staff. And that's the goal of the university. It's attainable. It's something that anybody can do and actually brings a lot of marketing and uh, communication about what we're doing at the university uh, quite easily. Our cooperative purchasing program, which I br uh, spoke briefly about earlier. Here are some of the contracts that we're actually sharing with K-12 
K-12 schools, NGOs, municipalities, counties, and others, we're basically saying if the university has already negotiated, competitively bid, did the research to make sure that these green products are being brought to the, uh, the campus, then why not share them off campus as well? So we're actually extending our contracts to those entities that I just mentioned, and they're buying the goods and services at the same price and quality at the university. So you can be a very small school off campus or anywhere within the state or even outside of the state and purchase goods and services off the university contract. And some of the things we're working on now, we got a green catering contract that's about ready to be released, um, soup, food service where office supplies, tissue, and toters. Now the interesting thing about this program, it's working out so well, we're like two years into it, uh, and we have 35 entities off campus that are purchasing against our contracts. The state of New Jersey uh, actually came to us and wanted to actually join the cooperative. Um, so we're going to actually let them join and they can in turn offer the contracts to all state entities, which is very interesting. Um, new green buildings coming up on campus. This is our new Rutgers Visitor Center. So we wanted to take a high profile building and get it completely off the grid. This building is actually going to open up uh, in September. So we took all the environmental attributes and applied it to that facility and actually made it a building that everyone would have to actually see. So the visitor center was a place that we felt we could demonstrate. Our seven acre, 1.4 megawatt solar farm was something that the purchasing department working with our utilities department were able to do the return on investment, leverage this against several grants at the federal, state, and local level, and the university's piece of the, the price was only 25% once we got finished with all the leveraging and negotiating. And so the return on investment or payback period for the university is only going to be three years. After that, we're actually in the positive. And then looking at the expansion of the university with dorms and buildings and other things and using above ground water treatment systems to actually deal with the affluent and the waste. And my computer has seized. Oh. All right, so one more slide and then I'll let you guys take an exhale. Um, what we've done is we've actually then said, okay, if the model itself can work at Rutgers, then why don't we start to work with uh, entities off campus? So up in the top left-hand corner is the New York City Transit Authority. We've been working with them uh, probably for the last seven years on looking at their hybrid buses. So whenever you go to New York City and you see the hybrid diesel buses, then you can think about Rutgers because we help them with that. Um, solar paneling on the Steelwell Avenue train station. Uh, literally took that power plant that's in front of it out of commission. We were able to generate enough electricity to do that. Uh, and some of the other private as well as public. And we had nothing to do with uh, Wachovia's financial issues. Our green purchasing program was only dealing with their landscaping outside. Um, but you can see it's pretty vast and we wanted to make sure that this model could actually work in a variety of different settings. And my favorite, which Kimberly always brings up, is working with m and Mars. Uh, since I'm a state employee, I can't get paid while I'm working, so they give me uh, candy bars as payment. So you go and do a lecture, and when you get finished, you get a whole box of uh, different kinds of Mars products. It's kind of insulting. <laughs> so uh, if you ever heard of the phrase, you work for peanuts, and you know, that's it. Um, and some of the others. And wrapping it all up, some ongoing uh, on-campus uh, initiatives, a lot on energy, water consumption, looking at the purity and quality of water uh, globally, but may, uh, mainly on campus, carbon trading, climate change. Uh, our farm to dining uh, program is working out quite nicely where we're actually bringing the farmers on campus. 35 farmers show up on campus every Friday uh, throughout the entire school year, all the way up until uh, the end of November. November is the cutoff for farmers. And so our dining services folks can actually pick and get what they need in order to prepare the meals on campus. Um, and Oh, that's me. So if you want to actually look slim on a picture, you take the corners and you kind of drag it 
and it makes you, you know. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. 